Hi, welcome to AmateurLogic.tv, episode 20. I'm George. I'm Tommy. And I'm Tina. And uh, we're glad to see everybody back again. It's been at least a couple of months since we've done anything. And I, I know uh, you're getting anxious to see something else uh, by the emails that we've been receiving. And we're ready to do another one, too. It's just been a real busy time here. Um, I've been pretty busy myself uh, with work, and I've been out of town. I've been in Las Vegas for the past uh, oh, week and a half with the NAB show that I have to go to every year to work. And uh, Tommy used to go to that show with me. Uh, we, we've spent a lot of years in Las Vegas together. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, I can't tell you how many times we've been out there. That's a lot of fun. Yeah, hopefully we'll drag you back out there again one day. Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. What's been going on with you? Well, as you can By see, way, I'm back yeah. in Mississippi, live and in color. <laughs> Live and in person, and uh, anyway, about to get relocated back down here. We close on our house Wednesday, and hopefully everything will smooth on out. And cool. It'll be good to have you back down here in the area, although I've got to say, Echo Link really worked great while you were gone, man. It's almost like you hadn't moved. Yeah, it actually pretty much was. Yeah. Saw you guys pretty much about the same amount. <laughs> yeah. Talked to you about the same amount. That's but, true. Uh, it's nice to be back home. I actually think you talked to us a little more when you were up there. You probably did. Yeah. Peter, what's been going on with you? Well, uh, I installed a Philips FM900, which has been converted to two meters, and I installed that in my car. And then uh, my other radio, my other two meter radio, an Alinko uh, DR150T, uh, I blew the finals up in that. So uh, I'm just in the pair shop for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hate to hear that. Say, so, Tommy, where's Jimmy today? Well, we got an email from Jim. Let me go ahead and read it, and uh, that'll kind of explain. Uh, Dear all, as the time for our next show draws near, I've been deep in thought about my continuing participation with Amateur Logic TV. On balance, I've decided to retire. My waning enthusiasm is no longer a match for the challenge, and you all deserve more. Please allow me to exit at this time and say I enjoyed our time together, but it's time for me to move on. Keep up the good work, and I'll be watching. Jim. Well, we're certainly going to miss him. Oh, yeah, no doubt. Mm -hmm. He was here from the yeah. very first show, and uh, maybe we can actually persuade him to submit a little content or come back from time to time. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe a few of the viewers out there will twist his arm. And, yeah, I hope you know. so. <laughs> well, Peter, do you have any emails uh, for this episode? I have a few. Uh, the first one here is from Yan. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, Delta Delta 8 Oscar Alpha, in, I presume that's in Germany. And he asks about green radios and, and perhaps whether we could do uh, a segment or something around that. Now, by green radios, I, I take it he means uh, ex-army radios, uh, uh, mainly portable radios. And uh, by pure coincidence, uh, I was invited uh, to do a tour of our local signals museum, which is a, a museum which is run by the Australian Army. And it's run by a friend of mine, uh, Major Jim, uh, who's um, a VK3ZKK. I got about an hour's worth of footage uh, looking at a whole range of old radios dating back from the Boer War all the way through to uh, Vietnam and, uh, and Korea, World War One, World War Two. Absolutely fascinating. And uh, I hope to show you some of that footage uh, in future episodes. Cool. We're looking forward to that. I've actually got your video here. I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. But I'm really looking forward to that and uh, seeing what your military radios were like there. I'm sure... You know, there's some similarities between uh, both of our uh, military equipment. You know, when he said green radio, I thought you know, he might have been talking about environmentally friendly radios. Yeah. You remember when they had green PCs? Mm. Yeah. Came out? That's the <laughs> same thing I thought when I heard that as well. Yeah. Well, I've got an email here. This is from my friend Cash Olson, who I ripped off the hot air solder <laughs> method from. <laughs> nice choice of words. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, I built the soft rock radio a few episodes back, and uh, it's Cash's website is where I found the details on how to, to use the uh, hot air gun to do the service mount soldering with. And he said, I'd like to, again, thank you for mentioning me in episode 17 and putting up my email address. He has some great viewers, and I had 20 replies and chose to honor them all. I sent out solder paste this morning, and I've heard back from a bunch of viewers. Uh, thanks to AmateurLogic.tv for helping spread the word about the hot air reflow method. Uh, thanks again, Cash. Uh, we're glad that you put that on there. 
Otherwise, I don't know how I would have soldered that. <laughs> I guess I would have done it the hard way with an iron. But, uh, you know, it's great to hear from you again, and we look forward to a future project you've got going on your website. Well, I've got uh, an email here from Peter, VK1NPW. And uh, for those who don't know, VK1 is uh, the Australian Capital Territory. Uh, and he's written to us and just asked whether we could possibly do a show on portable HF antennas. Uh, now, uh, I think that's quite a good idea. It'd be great to have some kind of constructional project about a, a portable HF antenna. And uh, I also received uh, an email from an, uh, another reviewer recently about uh, mentioning uh, the Aussie Pole, which is an Australian kit uh, that uh, produces a multi-band portable HF antenna. So I'm going to order one of those in, and we'll do it as a constructional project and put it on Amateur Logic. Cool. Sounds interesting. You know, I, I uh, built an antenna myself recently that will probably be in the next episode. And uh, I'll use the uh, MFJ antenna analyzer to actually test it and see that it performed as it should. And, uh, well, I'll be showing you more about that in the future. Cool. I've got an email here. If you get a chance, please give a mention on the show. I've discovered the show on YouTube in December of 2007 and have watched all of the fantastic episodes. I'm a British operator from the UK. I moved to Poland with my wife last year. I did not have a full UK license, so I cannot transmit in Poland. My call sign is M3ZVW. I therefore have a shortwave listening station, a Yesu FRG100 and a Yesu FTM10R. Please give mention to the great group of people that make up the NARC, Norwich Amateur Radio Club in Norfolk, England, who I miss meeting with. The work by you and your friends is very professional with fantastic content and humor. 73, John, M3ZVW in Poland. Wow. Well, you know, NARC means something different here in the U.S. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've got, uh, you know, it seems like every week, almost every day, I receive another offer for a free credit card with great interest rates and <laughs> all kind of benefits, and they just keep coming out of the woodworks. Yeah, man, I get them all the time, pretty much every day in the mail. Well, if you've gotten enough of them, here's a way out. Um, you know, under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, consumer credit reporting companies are permitted to include your name on a list that goes out to creditors and insurers for, so that they can make offers to you. Whether you want it or not, your name's on that list. Now, there's a way to get out of it, and that's to go to this website, www.optoutprescreen.com. You go there and uh, sign up and tell them you don't want the offers anymore, and they'll take your name off the list for five years. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah, I did it about a month ago, and I'm still getting offers right now, but they said it took a little while before your name actually you know, got I'm deleted. I'm definitely going to sign up for that. I did sign up on the no-call list that we have here. And, yeah, well, uh, I did, too. Eventually, that, that pretty well stopped them. So it did hopefully that'll pretty much same. did for me, except for the politicians and the charities. So yeah, I don't think so. you can ever get stop those guys. <laughs> All right, I've got an email here, guys, from Doug, uh, KI4YVI, and he says, uh, Gentlemen, I think I have a topic that would be super cool. Uh, has anyone ever heard of number stations? And indeed I have uh, there, Doug. And uh, it's... Uh, you know, this is really the X-Files of uh, the radio hobby. Uh, this is the mysterious, the unknown, the spooky. So uh, how about we have a look and find out about all about number stations now. Six, six, four, seven, five. Six, six, four. 
it's late at night, you're tuning across the shortwave spectrum when you come across a mysterious radio station. You hear a mechanized voice reading out a string of numbers. You listen more closely. It sounds like it could be a child's voice. And then you hear what sounds like a music box. And then the mechanized voice starts reading out more numbers. What have you tuned into? What is this station? It's all very, very spooky. Welcome to the world of numbers stations. These stations mysteriously appear on the short wave band and then just as quickly they disappear. Sometimes you will hear a mechanical voice reading out a string of numbers, but there are also a variety of transmissions that use other forms of communication such as Morse code, digital encryption, audio tones and strange noises that sound like a slot machine. These transmissions aren't registered with any government agency and generally government agencies do not acknowledge their existence. They can appear on any frequency at any time, but some do follow a regular schedule. So what are they? In general, they are probably encrypted messages sent by intelligence agencies to their spies overseas. There have been public trials of foreign intelligence agents caught with decoding equipment. This equipment sometimes consists of a one-time pad, a book of numbers that contains the code necessary to decrypt the message. One-time pads are a very secure form of encryption and almost impossible to decrypt. In light of this, intelligence agencies studying these transmissions do what is known as traffic analysis. They look at elements such as the time, frequency and proximity of messages to world events to make judgments about such things as the amount of foreign espionage activity occurring in a given place. So let's listen to some of the more well-known number stations and tell you the nicknames given to them by shortwave listeners. The station you heard at the beginning of the segment is known as the Lincolnshire Poacher, as it plays a few bars from a well-known folk song of the same name. Direction finding by radio amateurs has traced this station to a British Royal Air Force base in Cyprus. You can often hear this station on 14487, 15682 and 16084 kHz from about 1200 UTC. It is believed to be operated by MI6. The Lincolnshire Poacher has a sister station in Guam which sounds very similar. It too is believed to be operated by MI6 and it's called Cherry Ripe. Our friends in Cuba also like sending streams of numbers, but they do so in Spanish. Here is an excerpt from the Atención number station. Number stations have existed for a very long time, in fact since World War I. The former Eastern Bloc countries had number stations. One of the most famous was East Germany's G3 Gongs station. But there are other weird encrypted sounds as well. For example, the Japanese slot machine. The buzzer. Germany's Swedish Rhapsody, which sounds suspiciously like the ice cream man. And finally, the mysterious polytones. bit more 
more about numbers stations. If you're interested in finding out more, I suggest you visit Simon Mason's website. Thanks to Simon for the use of his sound samples and images. So when you're tuning around late at night and you come across a weird mechanical voice reading out a string of numbers, don't panic. It's just the nuts and bolts of the intelligence community at work. Happy listening. You know, I've heard those number stations on the air before, but I didn't really understand what I was listening to. Yeah, it's just a bunch of gibberish, but yeah, I've heard them before too, and uh, you know, <laughs> I really didn't know. I, I'd heard the term number stations before, but this shed a little light on it for me. Yeah, it was pretty neat. Well, uh, do you know uh, the uh, a few years ago, there was actually uh, a guy that actually re took recordings of all these different number stations and actually uh, re uh, released it on a uh, uh, as a CD. And uh, you can actually get a, a whole CD of nothing but number stations, which is uh, a pretty scary thought in itself. Uh, the RIAA has probably figured out a way to get <laughs> some money out of that, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got an uh, email here from mm. our friend Jeff in Chicago. And Jeff says, hi, guys, I just, uh, going back through all your shows, and I'm hooked. If there's anything I can do to help you guys out, just let me know. Considering that you do this for free, I truly appreciate all you do. You guys are quickly becoming a cult classic on the net. <laughs> George, grow the ponytail back. It's a great look. <laughs> well, I'm not sure my wife agrees with that. but <laughs> Well, Jeff, there is something you can do for us, and uh, you other viewers, too. Send us some videos. Um, you know, we, uh, especially with Jim gone now, uh, struggle to get, you know, content for the show put together in time to uh, try to have an episode every month or so. And uh, sometimes, you know, with life going on, uh, it's a little tough to get it out. So we certainly could use some videos from some viewers out there. If you've got something uh, where you've built a project or, uh, or anything you might think would be of interest to the amateur logic community here, uh, send us a video, or uh, at least for consideration, we'll look at it, and you know if it makes a cut there, uh, we'll put it on Amateur Logic. Mm. Yeah, no doubt. That's a great idea. Yeah, that's how Peter uh, joined us. <laughs> okay, I've got an email here from Sam VK3HBU, and Sam uh, sent us a little bit of a challenge here. He says, uh, "I would like to see a bit of a challenge. Maybe set yourself a limit of fifty dollars, and you have to build your own antenna." and do a series on that, or maybe say $30 and build your own team match, including all the big caps that would be an interesting seg segment to watch. Uh, that's uh, not a bad idea there, Sam. Uh, certainly I've mentioned the Aussie Pole, which is a little bit more expensive, and uh, we'll do that in the near future. Uh, and George, of course, has built an antenna just recently, and uh, he'll tell you more about that in a forthcoming episode. But uh, I have thought about the idea of uh, doing a, a two-metre uh, project, uh, let's say about a five element beam. I think uh, people might find that uh, useful, but I'll look into that further for you. Guys, I love the show, especially when the focus is ham radio. You guys are on the bleeding edge of ham radio mass media. I thought I'd let you know that I've incorporated your shows into the Ham Links Ham Radio Toolbar. It's a free Firefox and Internet Explorer add on that provides easy access to ham radio content and information, like a UTC clock and HF propagation indices. <clears throat> Excuse me. I hope that you'll check the toolbar on my site. I've also got some propagation stuff, pocket PC, PDA, ham radio software, product reviews, a blog, etc. Keep up the great work, Guy73, Pat, N0HR. And Pat's website is www.n0hr.com. And he indeed does have some pretty interesting stuff on there. Yeah, he does, particularly the pocket PC stuff. Any ham who's got a pocket PC... Yeah. Probably won't take a look at that because there is some really good stuff there. Yeah, the the Internet Explorer Firefox toolbar is pretty cool too. Yeah, it is. It is. Very cool. Well, I've got an email here from my friend Jeff, N3JBH. He says, Hi, I wanted you all to know that many of us around Latrobe, Pennsylvania, really enjoy the shows. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a real kick out of the tours. And we understand this production must be expensive. But we'd love to see the high gain factory and the Tintac factory someday. But no matter the less, uh, whatever you do, I'm certain you have a loyal following around here. Thank you for wonderful service and really great programming. Please keep it up. Well, Jeff, you're in luck. Uh, you and your uh, buddies up there around Latrobe, and I hope I'm saying that right. 
here's the tour of the high gain factory. We're talking with Tom Stone, who's a service manager of high gain. And uh, Tom's going to show us a little bit about the uh, high gain plant and how they build these rotors and antennas and all their products. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is the antenna rotator control for antennas like, uh, or excuse me, rotators like ham fours, tail twisters, AR40s, use a box similar to this, and they show you where you're pointing your antenna for whatever application. Of course, nobody ever sees anything except this side of it or the back side where you plug the plug, so I'll show you a little bit about the inside. What I have here is the overall view from inside. We have a big transformer for the power. We have a small transformer which powers the meter. So the reason we have two transformers is that we have to maintain power to the meter, but we can't supply power from the rotator at the same time. <laughs> the uh, starter capacitor for the rotator is located right here. That's one of more likely things which goes out on the older model rotators. We have a uh, metal chassis which is made here at one of our plants. They stamp it out for us. They bend it for us. It comes over in pieces. We put it together. We do all of the wiring. We stuff our own PC boards by hand. We are not in surface mount yet. We use common switches when possible, which are very reliable. And it takes approximately four hours to put one of these together. And she's building one here right now? Yes. Uh, Hill is, is putting one together. She's in the beginning stage. And you kind of see what it looks like when it starts out its life. So really, there's amazingly few parts in there to go bad. In this part, it's, it's very reliable. I do service on these. The average return on one of these is 15 to 40 years. Wow, that's pretty reliable. And with something on a tower, that's good. The rotators are also very reliable. Yeah. Anywhere from 10 to 30 years on the first maintenance. Wow. These are the little motors that go inside the rotators. They do all the work for you. When they're in the normal position, there is a disc brake inside which goes through a gear action and helps hold your antenna in the wind. In order to turn, it has to lift a shaft up off of the motor, or excuse me, off of the disc brake and freeze it and it will then turn. Now all of these parts we put together here at the factory, we do the top and bottom metal plates in the back on our stamping machines. We have laminations for the rotator. Uh, which we put together. If you look closely, you'll see the bobbins inside. We wind the bobbins and make an AC motor. We're the only people still using an AC motor. When we get done, we have a little testing machine here, which we test and make sure it goes both directions. If you look closely, you'll see the rotor shaft going up and down. It lifts it off of the brake. When it gets done, it returns and breaks the antenna. This is a finished product ready for testing, ready for insertion in the box. You rarely see it at this stage unless you're working on the rotator. What we have on top is the potentiometer, which turns with the rotator. It's engaging the bell housing at the top. This is a voltage divider, which sends a voltage back to your meter to tell you which way you're turning. Hmm. The motor below it, we just saw. Uh, we build that from scratch. We insert it and put it in the case and we do a basic test by hand to make sure the gears turn. It is hard to turn here but when it goes down through the gear action it's very very difficult to turn but like a car which is parked in first gear without a locking brake it can still turn in a good wind. So you'll see that some antennas will turn in the wind. To prevent that, we have a locking brake which comes out here, and a solenoid retracts it when you get ready to turn your rotator. Hmm. It shoves the brake out into, into a spline housing, which will not turn without breaking something. So it's very much like a, a parking brake on a car. The rotator then inserts into a casting somewhat like this. This is a uh, working model that we use for stacking. Inserts in here with bearings, 
and the top housing would engage on top like so, and this is what you see in the finished product. Now what model is this we're looking at? This particular model is a tail twister, which has this type of housing. The HAM4, the CD45, AR40 all use this round type housing. Okay. Uh, we do use the pigtail assembly now instead of the old terminal strips, which used to mount right mm -hmm. here. They're much quicker to hook up. You don't have to look up in the tower to see where to hook the wires up. Okay, that's probably much pretty quicker. nice, yeah. This is a DCU-1 controller. It uses a plasma display to give you a nice compass indicator of where you're pointing. It's easy to see. Uh, you don't have to translate the numbers because it also has a digital readout. The nice thing about these for contesters in particular is a interface on the back to hook up to your computer. Commonly what you'll see on a DX cluster is a, a station that you want to work. Mm -hmm. You click on it with a mouse, it puts your radio on frequency, it then sends a signal here to tell the rotator which direction to turn and turns it for you. Inside we have a uh, very straightforward construction. Uh, we still use through hole on this design. Uh, standard transformer, standard starting capacitor. Uh, we try to keep it as simple as possible, but there's a lot of labor in these. And they're a little more expensive, but for contest operations, for a lot of use, they're extremely nice. They do have a, a nice program feature where they unlock the rotator in one direction first before they go in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. and uh, that is in case you have ice on the on the rotator and locked oh, up. It okay. breaks the ice. Okay. What kind of antenna is this we're looking at? This is an antenna we make for MFJ. We do make several base station antennas for MFJ in this factory also. This is an MFJ 1786 loop antenna. This particular model does 15 meters through 40 meters. Coax feed at the bottom supplies RF voltage. It also supplies DC motor voltage, which turns the capacitor in the top. What kind of wattage would, would this unit handle? This, this particular antenna has a 150 watt maximum. There's a very good reason for it. If you ever see magazine articles on loop antennas, they're rarely rated over 5 watts. Wow. The reason being, this has a transformer action which steps the voltage up on the outside to approximately 40,000 volts. We tumble these capacitor plates, which we make ourselves, in a water solution to grind off all edges. At that voltage, you can't have any tolerance for edges. Yeah, any spike and flash over. You'll have spikes and flashovers, they're correct. These, these are rated at 50,000 volts wow. to handle it. Yeah, that is a big capacitor. DC, DC motor is on the bottom. The uh, mechanism at the bottom splits off the AC and DC voltages. AC goes to the loop, DC goes to drive the motor up this little cable here. These are quite reliable. They're very noise immune for both transmit and receive. They're a natural bandpass filter because the bandwidth is only 50 kc. Okay. I love them for that reason. Okay, at this station we have traps for all of the high, beam high power beam antennas. We have vertical trap antennas. They all start out in life at this point. What you have is a coil form inside which is wound with wire. It'll have various number of turns for different bands. And it's tied to the top and bottom or inside and outside of the trap. On the outside, we have the capacitor portion. In the inside is the inductor, the outside is the capacitor. And what you do is you slide this up and down to change frequency. Hmm. The finished product would look something like this. The way she tests it when she gets done is we have a little oscillator circuit here. It's an old-fashioned tube oscillator. The LC component in the trap completes the circuit. She checks it against a known trap and you get a frequency readout on the, on the counter. She also uses a radio to zero beat the trap. You hmm. actually put it on the frequency you want for each band. And behind me here on the wall, we have several different traps for all of the different models. And those are the ones she uses for reference. They work 
and they work on frequency. We put them in the test oscillator to set it up on frequency, and then we build the rest of them to, to the same specs. Back in the metal shop, we have all of our tubing, various sizes, shapes, purposes. Uh, we cut them to length. We drill holes in them as appropriate for the various locations. And we also have a swedging machine, which most of you are probably not familiar with that term. What it is, is a series of hammers which beat on the tube and squeeze it down to another size. Huh. The advantage of doing that is you don't have to use every size tube inside the next one. You can skip sizes and lighten the load, lighten the weight on the beams. Makes for uh, uh, very easy to construction. We also slot the tubes for the ones that go on the inside and put a hose clamp on them. This holds the tube in place. The old fashioned clamps had a bolt that went down through there. Yeah. They did two things. They deformed the metal and they allowed the outer tube to wobble on that bolt. So they did not hold it as well. As well as and the hose clamp huh? is also cheaper at the same time, so we go with that now. The slotting is to allow it to collapse onto the next tube with the hose clamp. Another advantage of the swedging action is you can stack tubes on the outside, like so, and use a uh, stacked arrangement, or you can use the inside for a tapered arrangement. What type of antenna is this? This would be a 14 AVQ, AV14 AVQ to be more precise. This is a vertical trapped antenna. This is the final packing area where all of the parts come together. Every place has to be filled before it goes in the box in order to ensure that every part is in the box. If, if there's a slot anywhere, we know that we missed something. So this you've got it drawn out on assembly. the board here so that they know they don't miss anything. There is a drawing on the board yeah. in the shape and size, and it has a part number for every part that goes on there. If somebody does not get the right part, I'm the service manager, I get the phone call. <laughs> As you can see, there's quite a few things yeah. that have to be checked to make sure that you have every part, and this is the way we do it. This is a wiper arm for the potentiometer. And so this just punches them out of the strap. Yeah, this one, this one guy does several jobs simultaneously. It's a multi-step operation. And if you look close, you'll see that one of them bends it, one of them punches it, another one punches it in a different place, all in one die. It saves a lot of cost. Oh. When MFJ purchased high gain in 1999, we got all of these dies, which we could not use. Telex decided to keep presses, so we had to purchase a couple of presses to go with the dies. But each wow. die has one function, makes one product. So y'all stamp all your own parts here. You don't don't really have to use any the outside. The vast majority. Castings we can't do, but parts we make. This is a special machine we built specially for one purpose, to make VHF antenna booms. Huh. When you have a boom, you have a lot of holes up and down the boom for the various elements, particularly if you've got 10 or 15 elements involved. Right. They all have to be in line. Right. This yeah. machine was built with, with a pin in the center of each die, which allows it to punch the, the boom in the correct place every time. The way we do that, we use a modified uh, wood splitter. Is that what it was, this was built from? That's basically what that started out in life as, the same technology. It presses up it in one operation, punches all holes for you so that you have it in the right place for that particular model every time. Yeah, I don't guess you'd ever get it right with the drill. That's the reason it came into existence. It's, it's slower and not as accurate to use a drill. This machine has one purpose also. It, it winds a 500, pot, a 500 ohm pot or a 1000 ohm pot, which goes in the potentiometer of the rotators. The wiper arm, which we saw earlier on the press, runs against that and becomes a voltage divider telling you which direction you go. So what type of wire is that wound with? This is a nickel based, uh, I believe it has chrome in it also, but it's okay. nickel based, so it's very hard to sort it to. 
In the back, what we have to do when we're finished with the strips, we have a flame sprayer which deposits liquid aluminum onto the nickel. Huh. You can sort it to that a lot better. Yeah, I, I would imagine so. This machine starts out with a bare strip and the nickel wire and winds it somewhere around, I forgot what the number is, something around 200 feet on a 500 ohm pot. Wow. So many ohms per inch. This so is, this is the finished product, huh? This is the finished product the way you see it when it comes out of the box. And that's a tail twister? This will be a T2X, also known as a tail twister. Well, Tom, thank you for showing us around the plant today. I'm sure our viewers have enjoyed seeing how high gain builds all this stuff. Thank you very much. Yeah, the high gain is pretty cool. I'm actually thinking about buying a high gain uh, vertical to put in my new house for buying. Yeah, that's what you said. I'd be interested to hear how that works out for you. Uh, Wayne and I had a good time uh, taping that. Wish we could have got a little more, but we were kind of getting pressed for time at uh, that particular time. Yeah. And uh, anyway, it's a pretty neat place. And if you've got uh, a need for some aluminum stock, man, they've got stuff there in uh, tremendous lengths. The, pretty much, if you've got a trailer long enough, they'll, they've got a piece that'll fill it. So wow. you can have any length yeah. you need. And if I get that uh, high gain antenna, I'm definitely going to roll some footage and do a good review of that. Cool. Well, I've got one more email. Okay. Our friend Bob, he sent us a link, said uh, that this link helped him study to pass his ham radio license. And uh, it's uh, www.hamradioclass.org. They have uh, technician classes. And uh, now he's going to go through the general class test to upgrade. Cool. I haven't seen so, that myself. I'll have to go check it out and yeah. uh, yeah. see what they have there. That's cool. It might be a good resource for some of you guys studying to upgrade. Okay. And uh, one more thing for our viewers here in the U.S. You know, um, it's, when is it? Uh, sometime next February, analog television's going away in the United States. Yeah. I've got a whole house full of TVs that are going to be obsolete. Well, I do, too. And uh, to help with the transition here, the uh, government has given away uh, free coupons that you can use to buy a DTV converter box. Uh, the boxes are available at Best Buy, Radio Shack, and various places now. They're uh, starting to uh, stock them. And uh, basically, the coupon is just a little card that they give you that's got a magnetic strip, and it's worth $40. You can get up to two of those cards per household. If you don't have satellite television and if you don't have cable television. So uh, who's ever completing the survey, keep those two things in mind. If you answer that you've got satellite or you've got cable, you won't get a coupon uh, to get a converter box with. Now, the converter I bought, and I did buy one, uh, was from Radio Shack. It was 59 bucks. So with the $40 coupon, you know, it was roughly 20 bucks that I got. Yeah. Uh, so not too bad. Anyway, here's the address. It's https colon slash slash www.dtv2009.gov. Cool. Well, well, maybe I'll save a couple of TVs then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when they uh, turn off the analog signals on all these stations, Basically, most of them will be taking down um, those transmitters, maybe changing some antennas, but they'll be increasing the power on their digital signals. So people with a digital TV right now, if you're not getting that great a reception, it should be getting better in the future. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, as they replace with uh, the digital. I do have one digital TV. But, you do? Uh, yeah, I've got four that aren't. Have you uh, hooked it up and tried to watch anything direct off antenna yet? The, t the, the, yeah, the digital TV? Yeah, okay. it doesn't look so hot. <laughs> well, it will be getting better <laughs> after February of next yeah. year. Peter, good to see you again. <laughs> yeah. Yep. No worries. I guess that does it for episode 20. It's been uh, good to be back again, and hopefully it won't be so long before the next episode. Yeah, no doubt. I think we'll be able to get together now. At least I'm about to get things kind of smoothed out. I'm ready to get back in the groove and crank sure. up some more material. All right, sounds good. We'll see you all again next time. See Bye. you next month. See you later.